During the early hours of June 1st, 2767, the AWOL Epsilon Indy Division appeared in their home system and started moving towards the planet. Their warship complement consisted of a Black Lion and Potemkin class cruiser, two Aegis cruisers and four Lola destroyers, plus the 20 jump ships that transported the bulk of the division. A day later, they were challenged by the space defense system. Unsurprisingly, it refused to accept them as a friendly force, and soon, 56 drone warships were arrayed against them. The defending drones scythed through the approaching vessels, swiftly destroying the entire transport flotilla. Only a mere 10% of the division lived to make landfall, and those were soon destroyed by the Imperial forces in garrison. None survived the battle, but reports of the bloodbath reached Kerensky via a civilian vessel not long afterwards. Analysis revealed the challenges that he would likely be facing in going up against the STS, but also some potential weaknesses. The STS would go on to become one of the greatest hurdles that Kerensky would face during his campaign against Amaris. Some question whether the system was worth having at all. When one looks at the results of the SDS during the war, it can be seen to be a highly effective and difficult foe to overcome without suffering great losses. The SLDF would have to develop entirely new tactics to counter and confuse the combat systems of the SDS network to grind their way toward terror. So from this point, yes, the SDS was a worthwhile investment. That being said, the entire point of its existence was to protect the Hegemony and the Star League as a whole, and here it completely failed. On June 2nd, word of Kerensky's declaration of war reached the Rimworld's capital of Apollo. The vast majority of the SLDF had been deployed on the far side of the inner sphere from them, and so they had not anticipated a significant threat. If an attack was coming, it was likely months away. At 3am the following morning, 12th Fleet launched Operation Black Buck against Apollo. The brainchild of retired Commodore Janos Grek, orbital strikes were made against key infrastructure including the spaceport and the Amaris Palace, levelling the facilities. Rimworld's regent Mohammed Salim realised the war would be coming to him much sooner than he anticipated. In the aftermath of the coup, the LCAF had redeployed the bulk of their forces to face the presumed hostile Amaris Empire, both the hegemony and the much longer Rimworld's Republic border. Those troops got quite a shock when the first SLDF armies started to materialise in the Alarian system, followed a few weeks later by another large deployment at Romulus. Kerensky did not trust the Draconis Combine, suspecting they were involved in the coup, and so therefore ordered all his troops to avoid the realm and take the long way around the hegemony. Even still, by late July, the last troops from the Outworlds Alliance had arrived. Kerensky as a general wielded near unlimited power within the ranks of the SLDF by respect alone. He'd fought on the front and wagered his own life to make the hard calls. He was one of them. He was fighting for his home and despite his own family under Amaris' thumb, he didn't rush to their aid or barter for their safety. He served the state and when offered everything, he simply said no. His legacy is a reminder of the meaning of actual service above all and what sacrifice actually means. The reasons Kerensky chose to target the Rimworlds instead of the Terran hegemony are myriad. For starters, he was leading a broken and wounded army. Reorganizing them into any sort of force capable of retaking Earth was going to take time. Choosing a softer target would gain them valuable experience fighting within their new structure similar to Lord Onaga's plan prior to his assault on the Hades Cluster during the Reunification War. Another reason was that they badly needed a central base from which to operate. The SLDF were persona non grata within the periphery, and weren't particularly welcome within the member states either. The Rimworlds had a well-developed and undamaged industrial base from which they could rearm, in addition to a wealth of resources they sorely needed. Lastly, it would give them time to let fiery tempers subside so they could fight with discipline and focus during their eventual counterattack on the hegemony. Many within the Amaris Empire could see the writing on the wall. The Rimworlds was about to suffer an invasion of overwhelming proportions. The 23rd Amaris Dragoons mistakenly believed that their emperor had meant for them to redeploy within the hegemony as many had transferred to replace losses after the coup. 
They left the periphery soon before the fighting started, but upon arrival at summer, they were shocked to find that Amaris had branded them as traitors. A brief engagement with the newly formed 19th Hegemony Patriots Regiment resulted in the Dragoons withdrawing, the survivors heading for the Draconis Combine. The 23rd Amaris Dragoons was the first unit from within the newly formed AEAF to desert. Though it wouldn't be the last, Amaris's faction would not suffer any serious issues of that nature until the latter stages of war. The same cannot be said for the Star League Defense Force. Dozens of units had either fled or flipped sides during the periphery uprising, and of those who had fought for the rebels, only two survived 2767 the 29th CAAN Marine within the Magistracy, and the 159th Hussars inside the Concordat. While the Epsilon Indy Division was the only unit of its size to desert, many smaller groups followed suit in the ensuing months and years, particularly as Kerensky continued to delay his return to the hegemony. Worse, the SLDF was forced to undertake pirate hunting missions against some of their former comrades, the 11th Hussars, now styling themselves as the Battered Brood, had built a nasty reputation based on piracy. Several other battalions attempted to forge a similar path before they were destroyed by the still loyal SLDF. In 2770, the 192nd Dragoon formed the pirate band McLaren's Forgotten, using the chaos of the Civil War to prey on undefended worlds. The following year, the few survivors of the disbanded 238th Mechanized Infantry turned brigand, raiding the vulnerable planets of the Rimworld's Republic as Karen's children. Amaris had never intended to lose the Rimworld's Republic, and Kerensky's move to invade his home nation had caught him completely by surprise. The Rimworld's army was a scant 12 line regiments and a number of reserve units, adding up to a mere 15 battle mech and 36 conventional regiments in defense. 45 militia units were their only support. They were about to face off against a combined 14 SLDF armies, a terrifying total of 789 battle mech and 882 conventional regiments. To say that the Rimworlds were unprepared to face such an assault would be an understatement. Frantically, Emperor Maris dispatched word to the Secret Army survivors, ordering them to redeploy. But given that hardly any called the Republic home, and that Amaris had recently thrown them under the bus, very few heeded the call. In fact, a handful of small companies actually joined the SLDF. Most simply dispersed back into their own nations, now notionally free of the Star League, handing over their equipment to their house militaries. On August 9th, the time had come, and the SLDF demanded the Rimworld's surrender. Mohammed Salim refused. The invasion began at once. The attacking force was divided into two halves. Task Force Kerensky would focus on the Corwood provinces, whereas Task Force de Chevalier would approach from the opposite end. Three armies within each task force would take point and leapfrog over each other during their advance. The four reserve armies would move into garrison positions behind them. These forward elements were organized into the newly stood up 14th and reconstituted 10th Army Group, formerly Army Group Amaris while the periphery uprising commands were disbanded. The SLDF's initial advance was slow and cautious. The history lessons of the reunification war gave them ample reason to be worried. However, it soon became apparent that resistance was almost non-existent. Those planetary militia garrisons they encountered provided only token opposition before surrendering. The actual Rimworld's army was nowhere to be found. This only added to their paranoia. The enemy was out there though, and the regular army soon fell victim to the insidiousness of the RWA. On persistence, a Rimworld's POW detonated an explosive vest within the camp of the 57th Mechanized Infantry Division, killing two dozen. This resulted in yet more caution, further slowing their advance. As the Star League troops continued, more of the defense force was relocating to the Rimworlds behind them. Of the five SLDF armies which had not yet participated in the fighting, 80% of their strength now joined together to form the second wave, organized alongside the reserve from the first wave into the 15th and 17th army groups. Together, they added another 549 battle mech 
and 513 conventional regiments to the mix, for a total of 1,338 mech and 1,395 conventional. One of the early goals of Task Force Kerensky was the capture of Apollo's jump points, which they achieved during the second wave in September. They then captured every HPG within 50 light years of the capital, isolating the leadership of the Rimworlds from the rest of their nation, just as Gregory Amaris had been centuries before. The first of the 20 Castles Brian 20th Army had abandoned back in 2757 was encountered on Circinus in September during De Chevalier's third wave of assaults. Unsurprisingly, the facility was now occupied by the 23rd Amaris Chasseurs. It took six weeks for the Airborne Dragons and Altair Division, a force 18 times their size, to flush them out, securing Camp Amber on October 25th. If the Rimworlds was going to act as a base of operations for the SLDF, they would need to establish naval yards to service their many fleets. One of their earliest targets was the hidden facility within the Dark Nebula. Despite its proximity to the capital Apollo, the dangers of navigating such a dense cloud of stars meant Amaris had never launched an expedition to find it. Camelot Command was back online in September, but was too small to maintain the entire navy. In early 2768, the Texas-class SLS Mountbatten led the assault against the shipyards within the Star's End system, constructed by the SLDF during the Reunification War. Though the RWN did not possess any warships in the periphery anymore, their assault dropships still put up a determined defence. Colonel Stephen McKenna led the Mountbatten's combat air group to victory after 14 hours of grueling combat, securing the facility intact. The last major dry dock was in the Erin system. Upon their arrival, Rimworld's saboteurs moved to deorbit the entire complex to deny the invaders its use. Quick action on the part of SLS Bambara's crew managed to save around 40% of the shipyard by using their own hull to push it back into a stable orbit. These three bases went most of the way to meeting their needs, but additional facilities were constructed in the years after, including another secret base at Odessa. The first year of the invasion did not play out in the way Kerensky had anticipated. Organised resistance dissipated in front of them, and in numerous incidents they arrived in time to find that Rimworld's forces had risen up against their political officers and executed them. These individuals professed to be true Republicans, not Amaris fanatics, a large part of the reason why they had not been entrusted with Operation Apotheosis. The RWA was already comically outgunned, but when pressed, it was revealed that more than half of their strength in the Rimworlds was actually an illusion. In the century since the Reunification War, the Amaris family had tried their best to eradicate the shadowy Rift Republican army. Gregory's decree that the Double RA were an illegal group had begun the civil war that had raged concurrently to the Inner Sphere Spanning conflict, and though they would lose both fights, the Double RA continued to exist on the ground. The arrival of the SLDF was the opportunity they had long hoped for. They quickly established themselves as the dominant force on a planetary level. For the most part, the Star League forces maintained discipline and were reserved in their conduct and use of strategic weapons during the invasion. There were a number of exceptions though. Food riots on Machu Picchu resulted in a brutal response which left more than a dozen dead and many more wounded. The worst incident was the execution of a hundred prisoners of war at Kutai Junction by the 90th Dragoons. Samir and Jari spun all of these atrocities into propaganda back in the hegemony which only added to their support. The first year concluded with a near disaster for the SLDF on August 17th, in a repeat of the Fort Simpson incident that had sparked the periphery uprising, a nuclear device was smuggled into Fort Merrimack on Erewhon. The arrival of the bomb was timed to coincide with an inspection by none other than the commanding general himself. Miraculously, the driver was shot on approach and the dead man switch failed to activate sparing the lives of hundreds at the base, Kerensky included. In late October, the tensions that had been building on Apollo ignited into open rebellion. At first, the 6th Amaris Lancers and 832nd Amaris Dragoons were dispatched to quell the riots, but soon they too fell into fighting among themselves as the Selim Regency lost all legitimacy. Kerensky had not planned an assault for some time yet, but could see that the moment had come quickly dispatching the 11th Army to establish a beachhead, an act that would earn them the nickname Apostles of Apollo. 
Upon arrival, they found very little organised resistance left. The last of the planetary militia had holed up inside two imitation castles Bryan built by Amaris, but were overrun three days later by Major General James McEvity's North American Division. Kerensky arrived soon after at the head of 20th Army. While they were setting up camp, they were approached by Major Philip Drummond of the 832nd Amaris Dragoons. Disillusioned with his emperor, Drummond turned over all the information he had to the SLDF. Later, once his loyalty was no longer in question, he freely joined Kerensky and fought against the Empire. The two Star League armies began to advance on the capital city, Terra Prime. Nobody tried to stop them, and they soon discovered why. On October 29th, an angry mob had broke into the palace during the night and dragged Mohammed Salim out into the streets, where they tried and hanged him bringing an end to the Battle of Apollo after only a week. The war with the Rimworlds wasn't quite over yet, however. The castles Brian continued to be a strong point in the RWA defence. Kerensky wanted to see these recaptured for his own use, but in several instances they were forced to turn to nuclear or orbital weapons. The 17th Amaris Dragoons were wiped out in such fashion within Fort Salisbury on Beauvais. Camp Siena was lost when the defenders on Milvano detonated explosives within the tunnels, killing both themselves and two whole infantry regiments, the greatest loss of life for the SLDF during the campaign. Castles Brian, the mighty fortresses of the Terran hegemony, were envisioned by Brian Cameron as the ultimate defensive installation. They would serve as command posts and fallback points for the SLDF and over the decades would expand across the inner sphere into the periphery. However, by the time of the Civil War, they were viewed more as symbols of Star League oppression than bastions of protection. 250 years on, they're now associated with something quite different. Treasure. For the most part, the SLDF emptied their enormous stockpiles of arms and materiel for use in their campaign against Ameris, but several bases still house vast quantities of spare parts, or so-called lost tech. The discovery of an intact base that has somehow escaped being ransacked in the centuries since the fall is equivalent to unearthing a burial site of one of ancient Egypt's pharaohs. Countless stories and legends exist of down-on-their-luck individuals stumbling across an undiscovered site and leaving with a fortune in Star League vintage equipment. By 2769, the invasion was winding down. The SLDF had managed to retake 11 of the castles Brian intact and three more with only moderate damage. The Amaris loyalists had gone to ground, none continued to fight openly. This left a significant power vacuum where once House Amaris and their allies had ruled. Stepping forward were the various double RA cells, but on account of their isolated nature, there was little consensus among them. Indeed, several continued to fight with what they considered to be the Star League aggressor. One such group was led by Amaris's estranged cousin, Mikhail, who was neither a friend to the Empire or Star League. Eventually though, the more moderate groups began to coalesce into a unified body. By early 2770, Commanding General Alexander Kerensky was willing to recognise the Rift Republican Army as the legitimate successor to House Omaris. Some 200 years earlier, Catherine Dormax had ignited the Civil War by defying the First Consul's orders to fire upon civilians. And now, her descendant Lucian Dormax notional head of the double RA, had a chance to lead the Rimworlds into a brave new future. When the Star League's 18th Army set up their headquarters on Engadine during the invasion of the Rimworlds Republic, they could not have anticipated the insidiousness of the attacks they would soon be subjected to. The Democrats of Brazil and Tobruk Division were responsible for pacifying the planet, but repeated ambushes and strikes saw them chasing ghosts, seeing threats in every shadow. The use of IEDs escalated things further, causing significant casualties to both civilians and soldiers alike. When reports reached General Gabriela Morano that the terrorists had acquired chemical weapons, she ordered her troops to hunker down, anticipating the worst. They waited, but nothing happened. Stories from the locals started to reach them soon after, tales of a night of death, as they called it. Rumours suggested that the entire terror cell had been found dead, killed by an unknown special ops team. Yet the general knew that there was no SAS forces on world. Two days later, Murano awoke in the night and found a box sitting beside her bed. Within, she found the head of the terrorist ringleader. 
but it was what she found sitting atop the box that fascinated her. A small, black, folded piece of origami in the shape of a cat. The calling card of House Kirita's mythical assassins, the Nekogami. The Nekogami, or spirit cats, are as close to an assassin's guild as exists in the inner sphere. Based in the Draconis Combine, and sharing many of the same traditions as the ruling house Kurita, they are considered hostile threats by the realm's internal security force. This has not stopped the Coordinator from hiring their services in truly exceptional circumstances. The Nekogami begin their training as children, and by the time they reach adulthood, all aspects of individuality or personality have been abandoned. They are fanatically dedicated to accomplishing their goal. Once hired, their mission ends in either success or death. They are as accomplished at subterfuge and sabotage as they are at assassination. Woe betide anyone who makes an enemy of the Nekogami. When the Amaris Empire and Star League Defense Force declared war on each other, both sides turned to the member states for support. None was forthcoming, as all cited the need to protect their own borders at this time of high tension. It was a pragmatic decision on their part, as there was little to gain by supporting the winner, and a lot to lose if they found themselves on the wrong side. This was the response of the Great Houses, but the common citizens of the Inner Sphere had quite a different outlook. Many of them were shocked at what had happened within the Terran hegemony, and outraged that their governments were not sending aid to Kerensky to assist in his liberation campaign. From their perspective, the Star League had been a great success. They were shielded from the harsh realities of life under the League in the periphery, the instability in the hegemony caused by Richard Cameron, or the political infighting, and sometimes real fighting, among the High Councillors. Though their rulers did nothing, the citizens flocked to Kerensky in droves, almost overwhelming the recruitment centres scattered across the Inner Sphere. One of those who signed on during this period was a teenager by the name of Jerome Winson. He'd first seen service in the Blue Star Division in 2770, but would go on to distinguish himself further later in the decade. Those who couldn't enrol with one of the military academies sought another way to join up. Soon, thousands of volunteers were arriving within the Vrimworlds, pledging their support. Occasionally, these weren't merely civilians, but AWOL soldiers and their equipment too. So too did the newly liberated Rimworlds Republic add their support. The commanding general welcomed this influx of personnel with open arms. He established a sizable training base outside Camp Amber on Circinus. The 16th and 18th Army Groups were set up to coordinate these efforts. In 2770, the Black Warriors Mercenary Unit, itself composed of former SLDF personnel, arrived at Circinus and took over training operations. The largest source for the new recruits was the Lyran Commonwealth. Such was the dissatisfaction with Archon Robert Steiner's decision not to participate in the war that riots broke out across the realm. His popularity was the lowest of any Archon since the nation's founding days, before Marsden's coup. Even his nephew Kalen Steiner joined up with the so-called Loyalists. Kerensky's volunteer brigades were made up of individuals from all walks of life and from all across the Inner Sphere. Several among them would rise to prominence during or after the campaign. Originally a major serving in the 832nd Amaris Dragoons for the Rimworld's Republic, Philip Drummond was stationed on the RWR capital of Apollo when a surprise attack came early in June of 2767. Two squadrons of SLDF made enough passes which ended up destroying the military area of the spaceport and Amaris's palace. Coupled with a blockade, Regent Mohammed Salim was royally crippled, but soon he'd be singing to the tune of the SLDF one way or another. In that way was Drummond's way. Having already become disillusioned by Amaris's coup, the abandonment of the Republic by Amaris was a step too far, and Philip would personally surrender to General Kerensky. Swearing an oath of loyalty to the great general, a man he held respect for, was made a lieutenant in the SLDF before going on to be an incredible source of information on the Rimworld's Republic. Providing the SLDF troop movements, tactics, personnel rosters, equipment rosters, and even back doors and otherwise impenetrable defenses, Philip Drummond was a source of great pride within the SLDF and to Krensky personally, who would go on to mention Drummond's efforts in speeches. Twin brothers originally serving in the Rimworld's Republic Armed Forces, Nigel and Herb Polchik actually fought against General Alexander Kerensky during the fighting on Apollo, but like many others, found themselves among the disillusioned and would end up siding and joining with Kerensky and the SLDF. The twin brothers were incredible when put together, 
and General Kerensky would greatly value their skills when working together on the battlefield. From a young age, Sandra Singh had aspirations to become a mech warrior in the SLDF. Born in the Capellan Confederation the same year Richard Cameron became First Lord, Sandra attended a Liao Mech Warrior Academy and found her chance to serve almost immediately after graduating, with the Terran campaign being planned by General Alexander Kerensky. Hans Jorgensen was another mech warrior who flew the coop to volunteer with Kerensky, formerly hailing from the Rosselhag region and serving within the DCMS. Sang and Jorgensen would see regular action throughout the Hegemony campaign, making it all the way to the final confrontation on Terra. The two would meet during the later stages of the war, fall in love, and marry soon after. The volunteer brigade suffered horrific casualties during the campaign, with fewer than 1 in 10 surviving. That is what Kerensky calls a big oof. Those that did would achieve a near legendary status among their peers, though they had enough humility to not seek godhood like some people. Huh, the name Blake is crossed out here. Weird. One unlikely group that came to Alexander's aid were the Ronin mech warriors of the Draconis Combine, with whom the SLDF had spent the last century fighting. Compelled by honor and respect to join Kerensky, they were some of the most skilled on Circinus. The unofficial head of this carder was Shin Katsumoto, an accomplished duelist. He revealed that the Ronin had been approached by House Kurita and encouraged to lend their skills to the Star League. In this way, Minoru was able to maintain plausible deniability, just as his predecessor, Urizen II, had during the First Hidden War. Alexander, though, didn't have much trust for anyone from the Combine, still believing that Kurita was in some way aligned with Amaris. The involvement of the Nekogami assassins in what appeared to be covert aid for the SLDF was most puzzling to him. By 2771, 12 volunteer brigades had been formed, approximately a third of which were staffed with inductees from the Republic. The losses suffered by Kerensky's forces during the Rimwells campaign were more than offset by these volunteers, though several units were still at severely depleted levels as a result of the periphery uprising. Even after the replacements took up new posts, eight divisions and as many independent regiments were still at less than 50% operational strength. Several corps that had suffered the worst of the periphery uprising were permanently taken off the rolls. The 13th, 18th, 28th, 38th, 42nd, 58th, and 70th. Shortly after the occupation of Apollo, Commanding General Kerensky initiated Operation Keyhole, an expedition into the Terran hegemony to gather intelligence for the upcoming campaign. The secret fleet had made contact with Kerensky early on, but after the loss of several warships on daring raids and guerrilla resupply missions, they scaled back their operations to surveillance on only the most important worlds. Admiral McTiernan now received more than 100 advanced Bug Eye class warships that would allow him to significantly expand his intelligence gathering. The international image that the hegemony was projecting at this time was one of perseverance and solidarity in the face of hard times. The citizens had united behind their strong new emperor, glad to be rid of the fool boy Cameron. Ashlyn Connor had enacted many new policies, inspiring the business community to work together in pursuit of creating the strongest economy within the inner sphere. Terra was in the midst of a scientific boom, with all sorts of new advancements coming out every day. Youth volunteer groups organized under Samir Rinjari helped their communities prosper. Kerensky, of course, was the devil incarnate, preying on the weak at the head of his pack of wolves. That was the propaganda. What Operation Keyhole found was a realm in chaos. The business elite that had supported Amaris were indeed starting to reap the benefits, while his troops had free reign to loot and pillage those that stood apart. The scientific golden age was a farce, created artificially by forcing every project across the hegemony to relocate to Earth, regardless of practicality or disruption. Much of the populace did stand in support, but with Injari in full control of the media, they were kept oblivious to some of the darker aspects of the Empire. To strengthen his control over the populace, Amaris formed the Hegemony Security Force, an organization akin to a secret police, not so dissimilar to the Cryptia of his own realm. Citizens were encouraged to report on any subversives in exchange for financial rewards, which tore communities and families apart. Furthermore, Lisa Outerbridge expanded the Office of Policy and Doctrine into a paramilitary force now bedecked with appropriately styled uniforms, and increased their oversight within each government department. Every planet's industry had been retooled to support the war effort, 
and the workers were faced with increasingly brutal demands on their output. Failure to meet these unrealistic goals could sometimes result in entire populations having their food supply cut off. The HSF was imposing a constant state of fear among the populace, disappearing anyone who stepped out of line. The OPD was rounding up the families of the SLDF soldiers and interning them in camps, and did the same with those working in vital industries as a way of inspiring hard work and loyalty. The worst atrocities Keyhole discovered were often perpetrated by the mercenaries in Amaris's employ. Helen, once a favourite holiday destination of Kerensky, had been ransacked by the Burning Tigers mercenary unit and its people put to the sword. Their occupation had resulted in over a hundred thousand deaths. Darabont's Damned had committed similar crimes on Zolokoffen. Likewise, the Greenhaven Gestapo had looted and burned half of Italy the ultimate insult to their host nation coming in 2770 with the murder of Pope Clement XXVII. In his final moments, the Pope had managed to transmit messages to the cardinals within the member states' capitals, suspending his authority for the duration of the crisis and granting them the necessary powers to continue running the Catholic Church. Cardinal Kinsey de' Medici of New Avalon misunderstood the message he received and believed that he alone was being entrusted with the position. When confirmation reached him of Clement XXVII's murder two years later, he proclaimed himself Pope Thomas X on December 5, 2772. Not all mercenaries were so morally destitute. The two surviving Northwind Highlander regiments lived on in hiding, making their home planet a hotbed of insurgents. The secret fleet did what they could to supply the Northwind Covenanters' resistance movement, but the abundance of Imperial forces made the task difficult. Additionally, the most prestigious and largest of all mercenary units, the Elysian Lancers, had freely thrown their nine regiments behind Kerensky. Unfortunately, the Greenhaven Gestapo took their revenge by destroying their Sicilian headquarters on Earth and imprisoning their families. Mercenary groups are inherently short-lived affairs. As a general rule, most burst onto the scene, spend a few brief years selling their services to whoever is desperate enough to hire them, and then succumb to either battlefield attrition, lack of funding, unscrupulous employers, or the passing of their commander. Occasionally, however, one will stand the test of time. A rare handful of these outfits operating 3025 can trace their origins back centuries. The Illyrian Lancers are as old as the Star League itself. Founded in 2572 by the Elysian Order, at their peak, they were larger than an SLDF division, a feat no other mercenary has ever matched. The Northwind Highlanders go all the way back to 2362, they were so acclaimed that House Cameron, of shared Scottish ancestry, recruited several of their best for service within the Royal Black Watch. Three of their regiments suffered brutal losses to the Usurper Amaris during the coup, but would rebuild in later years. Oldest of all are the Gravewalkers, who can truthfully claim to have served not just the Great Houses, but even the proto-states they grew out of. Recruitment for the 30 new divisions that Amaris had requested had not met the expected targets. To compensate for this, Lisa Elterbridge was given free reign to forcefully conscript as many as 10,000 hegemony citizens to fill out the roles of the hegemony patriots. By 2771, there were 10 double-strength patriot divisions, though on average, each division contained only two brigades of grunt infantry. Half of these formed the bulk of the new Home Guard Corps in Patrick Scoffin's reformed Amaris Empire Armed Forces. The losses suffered during Operation Apotheosis and the subsequent invasion of the Rimwelds led to the disbandment of six of the former RWA divisions. In their place, a further 14 had been raised, split between the three Liberation Armies. Each was split into four corps, two for each of the provinces, plus an Imperial Corps for Amaris himself and the Home Guard which was parceled out as needed. In total, the Empire could field 172 battle mech and 197 conventional regiments. More than half of the castle's Brian had survived the coup, and these now served as the home base for the forces of the Empire. Mercenaries were traditionally placed within one of the Amaris Lancers, if only for administrative reasons. Even more of these had flocked to Amaris's side, now totaling some 11 divisions. The greatest loss was that of the Tadio Amaris Imperial Division, though it was replaced by the Imperial Lancers a unit packed with some of the most ruthless mercenaries in Amaris's employ. One element of their defence that the Empire seemed to have been neglecting was their navy. 
With the exception of those captured during the coup, only 20 new warships had been added to the fleet. The final two Stefanomaris class battleships under construction had fallen into Kerensky's hand during the invasion of the Rimwalds. Still, SLDF estimates that Amaris possessed around 200 warships were found to be somewhat optimistic, the true figure being closer to 300. Additionally, nearly 50 orbital defence stations had been constructed across the hegemony. The bulk of their naval defences were entrusted to their now fully operational space defence systems. Almost all had been returned to service within the first two years of occupation. Continued efforts to disrupt the training of officers at Zabebel Ganubi resulted in the vindictive Colonel Vargo Burkenya executing hundreds of Alsop Robotics engineers. Even though Vargo and his command staff were later shot dead by partisans, the critical mass of knowledge had been reached, allowing the Empire to circumvent Alsop Robotics altogether and begin their own training programs. The lion's share of naval construction efforts went into expanding the SDS. Several new designs were launched by Amaris's goons, but none were as formidable as those of the Star League. The SLDF knew that it would only be a matter of time before they faced off against the space defence systems. In the run-up to their campaign against the hegemony, officers were briefed on the challenges that lay ahead. The ill-fated Epsilon Indy expedition may have failed to liberate their homeworld, but the engagement did reveal a flaw in the design to Kerensky, that being a small target within the engine block that if struck would activate the Casper's self-destruct sequence. Apart from the small picket forces found across the hegemony, 25 planets were protected by the more established and layered space defence systems. Attacking any would undoubtedly result in enormous casualties. Terra itself possessed the most formidable of all, the Reagan SDS. A conventional assault would be tantamount to a suicide mission. Without the element of surprise Amaris called on during the coup, Kerensky would have to find some other way to overcome this final hurdle. The Star League Navy and its apex operated a staggering 1,500 warships divided between their 20 battle fleets, plus half again that number spread across the inner sphere in isolated garrison. As many as a thousand more older vessels were mothballed or in states of disrepair. The second largest space navy in history, belonging to the Rimworld's Republic, peaked at a mere 300 warships. While they found enough serviceable vessels among the hulks of the captured reserve fleet to replace their losses suffered during the coup, it's still difficult to see how they could have hoped to hold off the larger SLN. That is, until one remembers the existence of the space defense systems. Caspers, essentially AI-controlled Lola-class destroyers, could be found in small numbers orbiting almost every hegemony world. Add to that the 25 systems equipped with entire fleets of the M5 drones, and suddenly Ameris' navy soars to around 2,000 capital ships. Kerensky's saving grace was that the drones were never easily transferred between systems, and so he could reliably predict through intelligence gathered by the secret fleet where he would encounter the fiercest blockade. The commanding general was still requesting military aid from the member states at this point, but other than a steady supply of volunteers making their way to the Stalik recruitment stations or the Rimworld's Republic, none was forthcoming. In fact, it was around this time that Amaris leveraged aid from the Draconis Combine to help quell civilian unrest. They dispatched forces to several worlds within the hegemony, including Athenry, Imbros, and Styx. This allowed him to redeploy his troops to other borders, Kerensky, of course, was unaware of the promises made between Takiro and Minoru regarding Ambassador Drago, and was now sure that House Kirita was playing the two sides against each other. Or so he thought. High Command became aware of two colossal supply depots on Halstead Station and Saddlebari within the Benjamin Military District. Despite the enormous wealth of materials housed at those locations, Warlord Ayaki Fujiwara had assigned only a tiny detachment of his Benjamin regulars to protect them. At this time, approximately 25% of the SLDF was hard at work dismantling their facilities across the Star League and moving any valuable parts and supplies to their staging posts in the Republic. Kerensky gave the controversial order to launch raids against the Curitan supply dumps. The engagements that followed perplexed the commanding general. A handful of shots were fired at the approaching SLDF before the defenders turned and orderly marched away, 
leaving the raiders free access to the facilities. State propaganda cast the Star League as nothing more than pirates, a far cry from their once noble purpose, and yet the DCMS made no efforts to stop them from removing the supplies from the Combine. In fact, upon their way out of Kurita space, they were approached by the carrier DCS Sol and her escorts, the DCS Kumamoto and Shizuoka. The Draconis Combine Admiralty had never shared the animosity between the ground forces of the two armies, and now these three warships defected to the Star League Navy. It was clear then that while the coordinator publicly denounced Kerensky, he was in fact prepared to offer him covert aid. Following on from the success of Operation Keyhole, Deputy Commanding General Aaron de Chevalier took command of the follow-up operation, Intruder. One of the losses of the Ameris coup had been the elite Terran RCT, but their five sister regimental combat teams were still operational and were now tasked with high-risk raids within the hegemony to disrupt Ameris' war preparations. Each established bases along the borders of their former host nations and made repeated strikes into the Empire. At first, this met with some success. The RCTs were careful to avoid any worlds with an SDS and severely harassed the AEAF all across the realm. They even managed to re-establish contact with a handful of SLDF units still fighting within the hegemony, such as the 39th 86th North American Infantry Battalion and the Cam Marines at Carver 5's Quantico Fortress. Operation Intruder primarily relied on civilian transportation to get around, provided to them by volunteers from Freedom and Liberty stations. Colonel Ezra Bradley's 3rd RCT, which operated out of the Draconis Combine, soon ran into the small Curitan garrisons that the coordinator had sent to Manus. The fights between the two units were brief, minute-long affairs, with both sides looking to disengage as soon as possible. However, the fleeting engagements were significantly exaggerated by rival propaganda within the other four member states, and the Curitans were portrayed as equally villainous to Stefan Amaris himself. This ultimately led Minoru Curita to declare the SLDF persona non grata within the Combine. 240 years on from the fall of the Star League, neither the SLDF nor Amaris Empire armed forces exist, but remnants of each military can still be seen in 3025 among the mercenary regiments employed by the Great Houses. The former is more conspicuous, with units such as the Eridani Light Horse still proudly waving the banner and maintaining the traditions of a bygone era. However, many citizens would be surprised to learn the number of mercs that can trace their origin back to the Maris camp. The 21st Rimworld's Regiment, the Blue Star Irregulars, is the most obvious. But others such as the always faithful Fuchida's Fusiliers, Grim Determination, Narhal's Raiders, and Raymond's Redcoats all harbor the descendants of those that brought down the fabled Star League. Now operating from the Free Worlds League, Colonel Bradley dispatched the 19th Striker Regiment to the world of Talitha to conduct a raid. Unfortunately, a double agent for both Amaris and the ISF had managed to infiltrate the unit and alerted the Empire to their presence. Imperial forces ambushed the Strikers on Weld and destroyed them entirely. But despite the losses suffered during the operation, of which the Strikers were just one, it was proving effective. The Chevalier gradually expanded Intruder in scope until 15 mixed brigades were involved, including some of the ad hoc periphery RCTs from the days before the uprising. As 2771 drew to a close, Alexander Kerensky once again turned his attention back towards the Terran hegemony. It had been five years since Stefan Amaris launched his coup, and the ultimate showdown between the two sides was looming. He made one last impassioned plea to the Great Houses for support. The best he received was one battalion of the 14th Zurich Lancers from the CCAF, who would help liberate the lost Capellan worlds. Curita, unsurprisingly, said no but so too did Kenya Marek. He and Alexander had never been on good terms, but until this point, the Free Worlds had at least tolerated the SLDF. No longer. The other two realms, while still refusing to offer military aid, helped establish staging posts on several worlds along the hegemony border, as did the Capellan Confederation. And so it was that High Commands began to draw up their plans for liberation, Operation Chieftain. The SLDF organized itself into three task forces, named for the member states who would provide their logistical backing. Alexander Kerensky led Task Force Confederation, Aaron de Chevalier commanded TF Sun, and Joan Brandt helmed TF Commonwealth. 
Admiral Ignacio Blake's failing health forced him to step down as Director of Naval Command. His replacement, known as the Professor, the recently re-enlisted and now Admiral Janos Grek, would instead control the Stalag Navy during the campaign. Several army groups were restructured at this time. Marek, Kirita and Davian became the 2nd, 4th and 5th respectively. The 15th and 17th, which had handled the occupation forces within the Rimwelds, now became frontline commands, and the 19th through 24th were newly established for chieftain, with the 23rd taking over training operations away from the front. In January 2772, they began to move. The Dormax government that had taken over the Rimworld Republic requested that Kerensky leave behind a garrison force to prevent those Amaris troops in hiding from rising back up in their absence. The commanding general was not prepared to do so, as he believed that he would need every man and woman in the battles to come. On February 9th, the last of the SLDF crossed over the border. The Republic was now on its own. It didn't take long for the fires of insurrection to break out, first on Götterdammerung in March, and then on Bucklands and Steelton soon after. All that was behind the SLDF, however, as they closed on their new mustering stations and prepared themselves for what lay ahead. In total, around 2,900 regiments were approaching the Empire, supported by 2,000 warships. On July 14th, 2772, Operation Chieftain commenced. Thank you so much for watching guys, that has covered the first phase of the war. Gets off to a little bit of a slow start, but uh, coming up next we have the Terran Hegemony campaign. Now the good news is I've already finished the first draft of that video, so it's about 95% done. Just waiting for a few uh, lines to come in from other folks. Hopefully we can get it out within the next two or three weeks. Now the next video on the Hegemony campaign is going to be the longest one we have done yet, not by a huge degree but uh, even longer than the one hour special on the Amaris coup. To be clear, the campaign could be as long as the entire series so far combined. There are so many details I could include, I mean I could go through each individual world if I felt that way inclined. But uh, I'm going to condense things down, you know, we need to get to the key events only. So I'm probably only going to cover about 10% of the worlds in any degree of detail, the rest I'm just going to talk about in brief. Thank you as always to all the guys who participated in this one. I really appreciate them taking the time to lend their voices to the project and uh, make this better for you guys. Thanks again for watching and I'll see you soon on another video.